pleasure for me to be here this evening to talk to you and hopefully provoke some discussion. The title, The Myth of Moral Neutrality, uh, is merely to make the point that the whole lecture is about, is that the idea of moral neutrality is in fact a myth in the sense that it is untrue, not in the sense that many myths are more true than what we call facts. Fairy tales, for instance, they're not true and yet they're more true than fact. But this particular one is not in that category. It's in the category of the myth, which is a deception. This started for me when I came back from Africa one year and I found on my desk a note from the Department of Education in our university, which is a secular university of a fairly aggressive reductionist variety, with lots of political correctness and all the rest, that said that I had to teach medicine from a morally neutral position. Well, when, when I had scraped myself off the ceiling, uh, I sat down and I hammered away at my word processor as a, an abreaction, really. I was so angry. Uh, at the end of the afternoon, I'd actually written a short paper. And I sent it to a good friend of mine, uh, another Dr. Stevens, Robert Stevens, who's the uh, director of the Canadian Christian Medical Dental Society. I sent it to him to read. Uh, he happened to be putting the journal to bed at the time. and He read it and decided he was going to publish it. So he did. Now, my response is, Bob, uh, that was written in one afternoon. I have not reread it. It has not been edited. He said, it's fine. It had a little passion attached to it. Uh, I comforted myself with the fact that the Canadian Christian Medical Dental Society is only a membership of about 1,300, and they only print about 1,500 copies of the journal, so I thought, there's not really much risk. You may or may not know that the average scientific journal these days is read by six people, including the referees. <laughs> we are into the business of writing papers, not into the business of actually contributing to knowledge. That's quite a different activity. In fact, so subtle has the whole thing become now that the real trick is to write a paper that is good enough to be published, but not important enough to be read. At that point, you don't even need to do the experiments. You can make the whole thing up, and you'll get promoted. If, however, you're not that clever, and you make up some data that has important implications, and somebody finds out that you cheat, then you'll lose your job. But it'll probably take five to ten years, so you can work it out what the cost-benefit analysis is. And quite clearly, there are people doing that. The ethics of the medical and scientific fraternity are diminishing, and such is the volume of publication that you can no longer trust the literature. In fact, I now teach a whole course on how to find the cheats. But that's another issue. The idea of moral neutrality sounds beautiful. It sounds nice. It sounds very Canadian, where we always want to make everybody feel comfortable all the while. But it, that is a perception without any content. In order to accept the idea in the first place, you have to have suspended reason. And it really only requires one question to make that clear. When someone asks me to practice medicine from a morally neutral position, I say, why? And they cannot answer that question without proposing some form of morality which is less than the one that I currently operate from. They have to say something like, because not doing so would be insensitive. But if the patient's problem is actually one of a misapprehension of lifestyle and of life itself. To be sensitive and affirming of what is in fact untrue is very bad medicine. There is no basis for giving any command which contains an injunction of the order of should or must or ought that is derived from a physical fact. It cannot be done. Even if you had cancer and I had the cure of cancer in my pocket, the human response would be to say, well, you must give it to me. But if this is a reductionist, amoral world, then it might so happen that your will was written out in my favor. And if you didn't know I'd got the cure, then I'd be better off to wait until you are dead and collect my winnings and then sell the cure. That way I win both ways. And for a Darwinian, that's exactly what would happen, logically. Fortunately, even the most ardent of Darwinians don't behave as badly as their beliefs would lead them to. But students are moving in that direction. So something of the order of 50% of medical students cheat to get into medical school. That's documented in numerous studies across the whole of North America. 
And of course, since we've been teaching them for something like 50 years that they are merely highly developed animals, that's a perfectly logical thing to do. After all, the lion does not ask the zebra for permission to eat breakfast. And that is the way medical students look at cheating. If you can get away with it and it gets you what you want, then it's called the name of the game. It's not, of course, the name of the game. So we have a major problem. Every society that is going to survive has to have some idea of good. What is good for the culture? What is good for society? We are moving away from the story that gave us the culture of Western Europe and North America towards another one. And the consequences are beginning to become clear. One of the other reasons for proposing moral neutrality is because the very same people also deny the objectivity of moral truth. That's something else that students all believe, which is untrue. And it takes not more than a moment or two to show that objective moral truth exists. The reason being, very simply, that we inhabit a moral universe which is significantly different from the physical universe. Our physical universe may be expanding, but all of us live somewhere with every statement between a true statement and a false statement. You've all had the experience of having a lie told about you and of having the truth told about you. When you get to truth in this direction, you can go no further. It is the end of the line. The moral universe on that particular line is limited at that point. You go in the other direction and you have a false statement. You go no further in that direction. It's limited. We live between two objective real standards that define our universe. And these pairs exist for a whole range of things. Fidelity and infidelity. Ask students whether those are real categories. Anybody who's had a lover depart knows that they are real categories. And unfortunately, many people know that these days. Honor and dishonor, sure, they're real categories. Justice, injustice, love and hatred. So how did we get to the idea of moral relativity? Well, we got there via the anthropologists who told a truthful but partial story. What they teach in their anthropology classes is that different cultures have different ideas of good and evil. That's not true at one level, and yet it is true at another. All cultures have these categories of true, false, love, hate. But within those categories, of course, there's a long continuum where I'm not particularly sure for a given statement whether this statement is true or false, or whether this behavior is honorable or dishonorable. And the way we deal with that in practice is by what I call a cultural story. And the cultural stories do differ. And it doesn't take away the objective categories. The error is to confuse the presence of relativity within particular judgments with the absence of the real categories. That's a very grave logical error to make. Now, it is absolutely true that cultures differ in the way they practice honor, for example. In Japan, if your business went bankrupt, or even to this day, if your business goes bankrupt, it is honorable to commit suicide. In Britain and North America, until relatively recently, it was honorable to wind the business up as effectively as you could and pay as many debts as possible. Now it appears to be honorable to hire a lawyer to pay as few debts as possible. The idea of what is honorable and acceptable in society still exists, but the story that is informing it is changing steadily. Knowledge is imperfect, but the categories do exist. And the stories that are available to deal with these big questions are relatively limited. There are, I would say, only at the most a dozen important stories by which to interpret our lives. We happen to be largely the inheritors of a Judeo-Christian story. If we had had the misfortune to inherit Das Kapital as the book that made sense of our society for the last 50 years, we would currently be in the situation of Eastern Europe and Russia. Whereas they say, we have lost a story which had ethics based on fear, and it is being replaced by a fear of the Mafia. We were fortunate in the story we had. Nobody here is a radical multiculturalist in the sense of saying that all stories are equal. They're not. If the book that in, had informed our society had been the Quran, we know what that would entail. The women here would be wearing veils. 
and various other aspects of society would be different. Even if the, the, the book informing our society had only been the Old Testament, then we would have a somewhat different society, something like what Israel has today, a Jewish story. Before the great religions of the world, the greatest religion was paganism, which is not an insult, and I have to say that every time because some people take it to be an insult. It's a description. Animistic paganism is not anything other than a description. It is a description of a society where there are local gods, and the way the world is understood is essentially magical not logical. A pagan society will never invent science because it's impossible from those presuppositions. Paganism was the biggest religion in the world and we are now proceeding back toward it. And it's the failure of our educators to understand this that is the heart of many of our problems. Because we have a mixed culture of those who still inhabit a Christian culture and those who have already moved to a pagan story and yet we apply the educational models which are only applicable to those within a Christian story, to those who are pagan, it's not surprising we're getting the answers we are. For example, sex education applied to street kids does not work because they are almost invariably totally fatalistic. To hear a street kid say, the bad time is when you're HIV negative. When you're HIV positive, you can have a ball. They've already given up in the sense of life, totally disillusioned, and they know that at some point they'll get the disease. The worry is only when. Once they've got it, they go mad. You give them a condom and they blow it up and make a balloon out of it. The fact that it doesn't work anyway is another issue, but certainly they're not going to take it seriously. So in our schools, we educate by manipulating the data and what we actually do is make perfectly normal, chaste kids feel there's something wrong with their hormones and try things they would not otherwise have tried. The net result, of course, is exactly what is demonstrated in the statistics from the whole of the Western world, that the amount of sexually transmitted disease we have is increasing and the age at which it begins is also diminishing. Of course, what the liberals say is how much worse it would have been if we hadn't had our programs in place. Uh, I suggest that it might be worth doing the experiment of suggesting that the alternative hypothesis is that the programs are at least in part responsible. So, moral neutrality does not exist, but we like the sense of the words. It makes us feel somehow nice. In particular, we're worried about something that we should be worried about, because to claim moral objectivity raises the specter of inappropriate intolerance. And the next thing that all students coming to university seem to believe these days is that tolerance is the first and primary virtue. Knowing this, I have over recent years frequently said to them, uh, welcome to my class, I'm afraid you will find I am somewhat intolerant. Uh, and you can see the body language tighten up immediately. And I will say, well, I see that you think I should take remedial tolerance 101, but before I do, I think that I can show that you are intolerant too. And the way I do it is very politically incorrect at one level and not at another. You see, nobody in the politically correct school has yet found a way to make a question politically incorrect. Neither have they found a way to make the reporting of published data politically incorrect. So I say, I want you to do a thought experiment for me. You may or may not know, and in many of the places where I speak in universities, it's generally known, that there is in North America an organization called NAMBLA. This is the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Their slogan used to be, eight is too late. Uh, they've modified it to be a little less abrasive now, but it's true that that was their slogan. And their objective is the legalization of sodomy between adult men and prepubertal boys on the grounds that done sensitively, the boys enjoy it. Now I say, since all of that is published knowledge by them in their own literature, that's not a problem. I say, now I want you to do the following experiment. And I'll ask you to do it. I want you to imagine that your parents are eight-year-old boys. And I want you to imagine that necessarily you have one of the members of Nambler wished on you as a house guest for several weeks. Now he's charming. He's very funny. He plays with the kids and they like him. He even cooks. You could hardly ask for a better house guest. Intelligent, witty, wealthy. 
he just has this statistically unusual view of what normal human sexuality should be. And the only question I have to ask you is, would you allow this charming, witty, sophisticated adult man to persuade your eight-year-olds that they're missing out on the rights of all eight-year-olds? Anybody who would, please raise your hand. Nobody ever has. Even when I've known that there were members of that organization in the audience. They will not actually say it in public that way. It's easier in print. Now, of course, at this point, you are all convicted of intolerance. Here I have demonstrated something that you will not tolerate. Now, the important question is, is your tolerance justified? And I would put it to you that it is justified. And it's justified on grounds of love. And you have no reason to say that your conception of what love is for those two boys is to be put at a lower level than that of a relative stranger who's been there only a few days. You have invested eight years in the rearing of those boys. You have demonstrated your love by being a parent. You have no reason whatsoever to be ashamed of saying, I think that would be an unloving act and I am in charge of this particular situation. You may not do that. I would put it to you furthermore that our culture as a whole actually depends more on appropriate intolerance than it does on tolerance. You see, what makes a society stable is in fact the things that you don't think about. You probably haven't thought about it this way, but it's a perfectly legitimate way to do it. You're hopefully intolerant of murder, rape, theft, adultery, the burning of widows, that's a whole range of things I'm utterly intolerant of and not in the least bit ashamed. We don't usually use the word intolerance, but it's a perfectly appropriate one. The problem is that we've become less intolerant than we used to. And that's why our society is less safe than it used to be, because we are being intimidated by false ideas. Let me illustrate. Uh, I grew up in working class Birmingham during and after the Second World War. Now, in working class Birmingham in those days, uh, there weren't many lights, the streets were dark at night. My mother often went across the city speaking to women's groups and would sometimes come back uh, at night quite late on the bus, we didn't have a car, and walk ten minutes from the bus stop to our house along these darkened streets. And my father never even thought about it as being dangerous because there was zero tolerance for attacks on women in that community. If any man had so much as threatened her and she had screamed, every door would have opened and I doubt the man would have been alive to greet the police when they arrived. So it was utterly safe for women to walk the streets. It's no longer true. And now we find people watching while other people are beaten up. In other words, we have become tolerant of things of which we ought to be intolerant. You only have to think about the way the word tolerance is and the word intolerance is used to see that this is true. In general, it's very hard to use the word tolerance in relation to something that is intrinsically good. If you go home to your wife or to your spouse tonight and say, I could tolerate a little love, you're not going to get very far. It's the wrong word. If you are charged with something of which you are innocent, you're not going to say, I could tolerate a little justice. You're going to demand it. And so it is with all the great virtues. Tolerance is a word that is really necessary because of who we are. Chesterton said, surely the one Christian doctrine that needs no proof is original sin. However much we might dislike it in the context of the child, those of you who have two-year-olds know that it's certainly present by that age. No. It's because we are who we are that we need tolerance, because none of us can reach the standards that we all acknowledge. We tolerate a little cheating on our taxes, a little speeding, a little this, a little that, because we are all fallen creatures. We know what is good, but doing it is an entirely different matter. We do have to choose between the different cultural stories that help us to live in this difficult world. And there's no reason to find that more difficult than we find choosing between scientific hypotheses. As a biochemist, if I'm faced with a set of data with two or three alternative hypotheses available to me, I will test the hypothesis with the data. 
And the one that explains the data most effectively will be the hypothesis that I take. We should do exactly the same with moral hypotheses. The data are questions, and I will come to those in a moment. The real reason that our society has moved in the direction that it has with moral neutrality is because of something that Pascal described beautifully some years ago. It's to do with the way we are understanding ourselves, and particularly the way the ideas of self-esteem and affirmation have been built up in our society, again, quite falsely. This is Pascal writing many years ago. It is the nature of self-esteem and of the human self to love only oneself and to consider oneself alone. But what can a man do? He wants to be great and finds that he is small. He wants to be happy and finds that he is unhappy. He wants to be perfect and finds that he is riddled with imperfections. He wants to be the object of men's affection and esteem and sees that his faults deserve only their dislike and contempt. The embarrassing position in which he finds himself produces in him the most unjust and criminal passion that can possibly be imagined. He conceives a mortal hatred of the truth which brings him down to earth and convinces him of his faults. He would like to be able to annihilate it, and not being able to destroy it in himself, he destroys it in the minds of others. That is to say, he concentrates all his efforts on concealing his faults both from others and from himself, and cannot stand being made to see them or their being seen by other people. That is at the heart of a self-loving individualistic culture. That is at the heart of most of my colleagues in academe, who now are quite straightforwardly opposed to there being any category of truth. I take a great deal of flack for suggesting that it exists, but not a great deal of debate in which I am beaten. Nowadays, the attack is much more likely to be in terms of slogans, in terms of epithets. I was not so very long ago called by the head of women's studies in a university in a debate a rapist not on the grounds of any sexual activity, but on the grounds of the ways in which I use words. I had said, because we were debating harassment guidelines, in which she argued that a professor never had the right to make a student uncomfortable. And I said, since students usually come possessed of a whole series of incoherent ideas, I am bound to make them feel uncomfortable when I point out that incoherence, and that is my job as a professor. Furthermore, I could point to a good many students who have gone through that process and are now very glad to call me their friend. At least three of them have asked me to preach at their weddings. I don't know many professors of biochemistry who can say that. <laughs> she said, you are speaking like a rapist but because they always say that the victim likes it afterwards. Interesting concept, I said. Can we proceed with the debate? The world that will take on board ideas like moral neutrality is in deep trouble. Because as I think, and I hope I have shown you, it is utterly insupportable and indefensible. The problem is that we have forgotten how to recognize truth. Logic is almost dead in our society. I can illustrate that to you in a somewhat uh, flippant fashion. I often say to students in lectures, if you're fit, you don't need exercise and if you're sick, you shouldn't take it. I can even get them to write that down. The bright ones look up and I say, did I say something wrong? And they say, we think so. And I say, well, can you explain to me why or how I said something wrong? And not one in a hundred can recognize the first error in logic, which is the undistributed middle. And politicians who would have been laughed at 50 years ago use it the whole while. You are either going to have euthanasia or you're going to die in excruciating pain. It's the same argument, the undistributed middle. Most of the world is like me, neither fit nor sick, just a slightly lazy slob. When it comes to dying, most people are not going to die in excruciating pain. Neither do they need to be killed. They will slide out of life, sadly, never having confronted it live comfortably and meaninglessly for most of their life. So as long as we diminish our intellectual sharpness to the point 
that we have done so far, there's little hope of an easy resurrection. A lot of education is required. Some still recognize it. There was a wonderful lecture a few years ago by a Jewish professor of jurisprudence from Yale in which he gave a lecture on justice. And he said at one point in the lecture, he said, I want to believe, and so do you, in a transcendent set of laws defining exactly what right and wrong are and telling us how to live righteously. And he said, and I want to live and believe, and so do you, in no such thing, but rather that we are able to create our own laws, decide for ourselves what is good and evil and what is right and wrong. What we want, heaven help us, he said, is simultaneously to be perfectly ruled and perfectly free. Now he knew, having put it so crisply and clearly, that that was not possible. His lecture proceeds with this discussion, how are we going to solve this problem in a society that clearly needs justice but doesn't want to pay the price. He comes to the end of the lecture and he says something like this, he says, it seems to me that we are all that we have. In other words, he comes down on the side of creating law, not discovering it. And he says, if that is true, then the outlook is extraordinarily unappetizing. Because if all men are brothers, the reigning model would appear to be Cain and Abel. And nowadays, you have to explain to most audiences that Cain and Abel were the first brothers and that Cain murdered Abel. And then, not being able to live with his own conclusions, he says something like this, he says, nevertheless, Buying and selling one another is depraved. Napalming the poor is wicked. There is in this world such a thing as evil. But he went back to Yale and never again attempted a serious lecture on the philosophy of justice. Spent the rest of his life dotting the I's and crossing the T's of common law. I'm told a wonderful, kind, loving man, but unable to face what he clearly showed. If there is to be justice, there must be transcendence. If there is no tr transcendence, there can be no justice. There can only be power. There is hardly a university law school that has a course on the philosophy of justice in North America now. And those that do, it is not a required course. Because if you want a job as a lawyer, just as if you want a job as a doctor, it is your technical skills that will be required not your philosophical knowledge. We have replaced what the Greeks called telos, purpose, with what the Greeks called techne, from which we get our word technique. All that matters now is the process. The ends have been forgotten. All sorts of areas of life this can be illustrated from, and it is a terrible thing. Perhaps one of the most insidious is that phrase, he is so sincere. And sincerity is so important. Well, as Iris Murdoch said some years ago, that's the problem with our society, that we have replaced the hard idea of truth with the soft idea of sincerity. The trouble is, you can be sincerely wrong. My contention would be that we are sincerely wrong about many of the most important issues. Let me return now, finally, to the testing of moral stories. How is it to be done? How are we to come up with ways of dealing with moral differences that will solve this problem? Well, I would put it to you that what we should do is first of all agree as to what the questions are and then put each of the ideas, the stories, to the test. I tell medical students that they have six or nine questions to answer depending upon which mood I'm in and since we have time tonight, you can have the nine. It's really three in three versions, but that doesn't matter. And if they don't answer these questions, they will be, like many of my colleagues, either workaholics or alcoholics or drug addicts or something of the sort. Doctors, after all, commit suicide more than almost everybody else except dentists. And it's because there are unsettled questions. To be able to live at peace in the world, you must be able to answer these questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? 
How can I make sense of suffering? How do I come to terms with my own and others' mortality? How can I believe in justice? Or as Thomas Aquinas put it, what can I know? What may I believe? What should I do? Those questions, of course, are a full philosophy course in their own right. But they are the questions that everybody has to answer at the end of the day. The only experience that we will all have in common in this room is death. We will all face that and we all need to come to terms with it. Because it undermines the libertarian principles of our society and demands moral objectivity to be answered, we even teach medicine now in a way that cannot answer these questions. We have chosen a model in virtually every medical school that is demonstrably inadequate because we teach medicine on a biopsychosocial model of the human person. In other words, when you go to see a modern doctor, he presumes that you can be totally explained in terms of biology, psychology, and sociology. That is to trash the whole of the literature of the world, which is, whether it be Christian or Muslim or atheist or whatever, always recognizes that there is something in humankind which cannot be constrained within those three categories. We are spiritual beings. We are the only beings on this earth who have angst about the future, who know the difference between good and evil. All of you know that. I only have to ask the question, are you perfect? No one will raise a hand because you know that everybody else would laugh. But in not raising your hand, you have done two things. You have acknowledged that there is a standard that you recognize by which to make the measurement. And you have recognized that you do not reach it. So any story that informs your life must deal with that phenomenon, which was the starting point for my own personal journey into active faith, when I discovered that one man at least knew exactly what the problem was. The good that I want to do, I cannot do. The evil that I do not wish to do, that I so often end up doing. That must be the starting point for anybody, I would maintain, who wishes to be intellectually honest. That, of course, leads on to an inevitably religious discussion of all of those questions. The good news, I think, is that we are approaching a point where we are about to see a major sea change because the hard sciences are getting closer and closer to the point of being almost inevitably theists. You may or may not know that if you, go, if you send your children to university or you go to university yourself, the probability that you will be Christian at the end of that university, if you start as a Christian, is highest in the hard sciences and lowest in the soft sciences. The more rigorous and demanding the standards of the science, the more they are likely to compel you to theism. So up until the present, astrophysics and nuclear physics have had the highest proportion of Christians. And the lowest is in the pseudosciences of sociology, anthropology, and psychology. That being so, where's the next move? Well, it's in my own field of molecular biology. I don't think I could find a molecular biologist who would be willing to debate Darwinianism with me now in public. Because as we get nearer to the bottom of the heap, so to speak, or the bottom of the pile, things are not getting simpler. They're getting more complex. There is, as one of my colleagues put it, an irreducible complexity to the world. And the more we learn about it, the more frightening it becomes for those who wish to deny the existence of God. A few weeks ago, in Cuba, of all places, I found myself lecturing on Christian ethics in the Department of Marxism and Leninism at the University of Santa Clara, if you can believe that. And the reason was because they too are worried about ethics. I have a colleague who is an honorary professor in the University of Beijing who was headhunted by the Chinese government. And do you know what the first course they wanted from him was? The Bible in English literature. Because they said our problem is ethics and we realize that ethics is transmitted by literature and the literature of the Western world which gives the ethics which supports science is rooted in the Bible. They've done their homework. 
I have been asked to go three times now to the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences to talk about these issues for the same sorts of reasons. But in Cuba, it came to me that there was a very clean way to put this problem, which I thought that they would accept. And they did. And it goes like this. If I had written on that screen behind me when you came in the following sentence, this message assembled itself. I trust that none of you would think it true. And I asked that in Cuba, and of course none of them did. I then crossed out the word message and put in DNA, the genetic code. I said, but you do believe this sentence, and yet all I have done is, so to speak, change the alphabet, the ink, and the paper. Because DNA is a code, and we have no analogy for code but intelligence. Now your problem is that you don't know how ethics can function in a reductionist world. Lewis understood this 40 years ago, 50 years ago. He said something like this, he said, when men give up on God and believe that they are products of their genes and their environment, he didn't put it in those words, but you can find the same thoughts, then there is a problem because Few men govern many men, that's the nature of all societies. But if they are products of their genes and their environment, the only grounds on which they rule is their own desires, if they have sufficient power. They have no freedom then, freedom has disappeared. So in Lewis's words, man's conquest of nature at that point turns out to be nature's conquest of man. But if we are created, if the intelligence that can specify you and me in an amount of DNA that could be stored on a period at the end of a sentence, if such an intelligence had given some rules, the transcendent rules that Leff was seeking for, then they would certainly be worth considering. And they would apply to the king and the peasant, the president and the pauper. And what re-emerges? Why freedom re-emerges? because freedom can only exist within a context of law. And that is a problem. And that is why moral neutrality is a foolish idea. The evidence that God exists is overwhelming. That doesn't make him a Christian God or anything like that. But transcendence is necessary for the existence of society. And those in the US who take a radical view of the separation of church and state need to go back and do some basic thinking. The reason for the separation was to keep the state out of the church. It is the church's job to interfere in the state. Not coercively, not by enforcing things, except a real recognition that truth exists and that some questions must both be asked and answered. They are, as it used to be said on the examinations, to be attempted by all candidates. Thank you.